So welcome all to this session of the Raising Peace event. The Raising Peace Network is an informal network of people and organizations that celebrate peace and the people and organizations that work for peace, promote dialogue about peace and the issues related to peace and create positive engagement in the ongoing process of peace. You find more information on our website, raisingpeace.org.au. My name is Vishuringa, and I'm part of the organizing group of the Raising Peace Network. I'm a representative of the Religious Society of Friends, Quakers in New South Wales. First, I will acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which each of us is located at the present moment. I acknowledge the strong bonds that the traditional owners had with the landscape, the flora and fauna, the waters and the seasons, the special and sacred places, and that these bonds have mostly been broken since colonization. The land was never ceded. I acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge indigenous people in our audience today. This afternoon, we'll focus on exploring ways forward, diplomacy, the Gandhi projects, programs for peace education, and the role of the United Nations Quaker Office. There will be two sessions with a break in the middle. The Trade Union Choir has recorded a number of songs and they will be played in the break, that is from 10 past three till 10 to four. Time to stretch your legs and listen to some good choir singing. As you know, this session is being recorded and the recording will be placed on our website in the next days. The speakers in this first session are John Langmore and Alison Bronowski. They will each speak for about 15 to 20 minutes. Then they will have a conversation with each other and they know each other for quite a few decades. And, they have, and then there will be 20 minutes at the end for questions. Please put your questions in the chat. After the break and the trade union choir, Margaret Hepworth and Alicia Dundas will speak in a similar format, about 15 to 20 minutes each, then a conversation between the two of them, and then time for questions. The owner is our tech host for today, and she will make sure that if there are any technological hitches, they will be solved soon. So I'll first introduce Alison and John, and uh, then they will speak. Introducing, introducing Alison Bronowski and highlighting her career could take most of the afternoon. So I will just mention some aspects. Alison was an Australian diplomat and served in many countries, Japan, Burma, Iran, the Philippines, Jordan, South Korea, the USA and Mexico. She worked at the, United, at the Australian mission to the United Nations in New York. Alison lectures, writes and broadcasts in Australia and abroad on Asian affairs and cultural and political issues. Her latest book is with David Stevens, the Honesty History book in 2017. Alison is the vice president of Australians for War Powers Reform. With Professor John Langmore, again, uh, highlighting, I'm only highlighting some of John's long career as it would take most of the afternoon to read it all. John started as an economics lecturer in Papua New Guinea a long time ago, then was an advisor to Ralph Willis, when Willis was the Minister for Employment and Industrial Relations in the Hawke government. John was a member of the Federal Parliament for the Labour Party from 1984 till 1996. John was the director of the UN Secretariat Division for Social Policy and Development in New York for five years. Since 2005, he has been a professorial fellow in the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne where he is still taking, where he is still part of the peace building initiative. John was one of the two founders of the Australia Institute. 
He was the national president of the United Nations Association Australia and was a member of the founding committee of ICANN, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. There's such just a few highlights from these CVs. I think you will all agree that we're very fortunate to have two speakers this afternoon with such a wealth of experience and knowledge. Alison, you will start first, I understand. And then uh, John will continue after Alison has finished. Thank you, Wiz. And thank you to Raising Peace for your initiative in doing this three-day event, which uh, reflects the kind of um, upsurge of interest around Australia in these issues, particularly at this time. I think the public as a whole in Australia are now much more aware of the risks we face of the lack uh, of guidance that we are getting towards dealing with them and the urgency therefore for ordinary people like ourselves to take it in our own hands and do what we can and use our, whatever influence we have to make change for the better. And I congratulate you on your efforts, joining many others in that direction. There are so many things, as you say, for us to consider here under the general heading of foreign affairs and defense. These days in Australia, foreign affairs is almost undifferentiable from defense. And that is a comment in itself. In the past, in my working life, that was not the case. What we aimed at as Australian diplomats is what Gareth Evans used to call good international citizenship. We did a lot with the UN, we did a lot with ASEAN, we did a lot with other international organizations. And we tried very hard to make a, a positive difference in the world. Now, what I'm just describing must seem to younger listeners as something like a totally different world. Well, it was, because our world has changed. Our world began to change before 2001. In fact, I decided to leave the Australian Foreign Service in 1996 because I could not see how I could be a useful worker for a Howard government. I could see the direction in which we were headed then. And I decided to get out of it, do a PhD, do some academic work, do some more writing and so on. Because even then, and that was before 2001, we were already headed down a different track, a track that went away from peace, a track that went away from Asia, which had been my main focus in my working life, a track that made potential enemies out of our neighbors instead of friends. And I could not see what the use for Australia of that would be. And in fact, the consequences have turned out to be much worse than I expected. With the uh, attacks on the United States in 2001, we took a more uncritical approach to United States foreign and defense policy than I have ever seen in my life. And it has ended us up where we are with an Australian foreign service that used to be well respected around the world, now not being listened to, now barely being invited to any significant meeting where our opinion is taken account of, because people know what our opinion is already. We are just going to go ditto to whatever the United States says, except when it's about climate change, and then we don't go ditto, ditto because that would have even been, in the view of our government, worse. And so that's, as a, as a case study, if you like, as an example of where we have ended up, you might consider where we now are with the 
it, recent events in the Solomon Islands. Now, for many years, um, Australia did what we thought we should do in the Pacific, but in the most recent of those years, we have actually cut the resources that we put into aid and into diplomacy there. And those states, the small island states in the Pacific, are very well aware of the neglect in which, with which they are treated. They notice when we send minor ministers. They notice when the ministers we do send don't enjoy themselves and get into the spirit of the discussions that are available. They notice when we ignore their pleas for action on climate change and instead give them security protection against their internal enemies. Now, this is not the way we used to run things. And you might say, and people will, the world has changed. Certainly the world has changed and we need to change with it. But the direction in which Australia is changing seems to me to be mistaken. And I fear that the consequences of that are going to be worse, not better. The reason I'm pessimistic is because we don't have the kind of discussion, that's to say, outside of this public forum that, that I was referring to at the beginning, we don't have the sort of political discussion that we need to be having. Our major parties do not have enough articulated difference between themselves to make to offer choices to the voting public that head in the, in the sort of direction that I'm suggesting, that we re-establish our good global citizenship, that we re-establish our reputation in international organizations, and that we do so in our region in ways that are useful and relevant to them, not in, in ways that are hostile, backward looking, and out of touch, which is what I suggest we are. One of the ways we need to do this is to revitalize and re um, uh, uh, energize our foreign service by properly resourcing it. The resources that we give to both foreign aid, which I mentioned, and to our diplomatic service as a whole have been decreased every year for years and years, until we are now scratching to find the kinds of people to do the kinds of work and even hand on their own example to junior people who are coming up. We're, we're losing generations of talent. It's going to be very difficult for future governments to make up that lack, but that is the only way that we can hope to reclaim our lost reputation in the world. And I have to say, you know, we sit here knowing so little from our deficient media about what is going on in the world, we don't hear enough of what Australia is missing out on and the, the initiatives that other countries are taking. And John will speak probably, I hope, uh, later about particular new initiatives at the UN about which we hear very, very little. Unless we're watching it carefully, Australians wouldn't know. Now I've lived in countries smaller than ours where the UN and international activities are taken very seriously indeed because those countries, particularly the non-aligned ones, know that the international system is all that stands between them and being pushed around by bigger and stronger countries. And when we hear, as we so often do from our leaders about the international rules-based order, I hope that everybody will shudder as I do and acknowledge what China and Russia have recently said which is it's not an international rules-based order, that is to say rules made in the United States for all the others, 
but an international law-based order that they want to see respected in the world. And that is what we are not doing. There's no need to talk about international rules. We have already an international law-based order. We are all signatories of the UN Charter. And that says that we will not threaten or use force against our neighbors. So do other treaties, including the ANZUS Treaty. Article one, threat and use of force will not be undertaken. The same with the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation with the ASEAN countries, to which not only we, but also Russia, China, and the United States are signatories. So not threatening or using force against our neighbors is the starting point of our climb back to decent, good international citizenship and proper use of Australia's real capacities that have been lost in diplomacy. I'll leave it there and I look forward to discussing it further with John. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Alison and John. Can you continue this conversation? Yes, I can. And and uh, one or two of the points which Alison made are ones which I would uh, ha had thought to make myself, but I but uh, they're they're centrally important. I've got six points. Um, that I'll try and cover in, in quarter of an hour. The first is that, that uh, and I'm quite sure I don't have to persuade uh, this group about, is that our goal in foreign policy should be, should be peace. And uh, at, at present, it's nothing like that. Uh, the, the, the goal, of course, articulating national interests is a complex task because uh, different sectors of the community and and different states, different regions, uh, uh, the private sector, the union sector, the churches, the sporting clubs, they all have different different things that they want governments to to aim for. But it 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 seemed to me when I was a member of parliament that what people wanted most above everything was security in the sense of uh, that being the, the, the absence of, of, of violent conflict. And so that another way of saying that is, is the goal of peace. And it's important that that be emphasized because it's not what one hears being articulated uh, by uh, the present uh, government in any way at all, and and uh, uh, I have to admit that even Labor doesn't say it as often as they might. However, I don't don't completely agree with Alison's point that the that the parties are, uh, are very similar. Uh, they are similar in some ways, but I think you would find that that as in the same way that Gareth Evans. Uh, was our most outstanding foreign minister since the war. Uh, I think Penny Wong would be an absolutely outstanding foreign minister as well. And the quality, I say that not just because she's a, a very, very able and capable person uh, who, and anyone who's seen her uh, uh, asking the questions at Senate at Senate budget committees would, would agree, but, or, or speaking in the Senate, but, uh, in the sense that she's had made a series of, of, of addresses uh, since she became shadow foreign affairs minister in about, in about uh, 2017, uh, which have taken on one after another, a whole series of the major issues in foreign policy. And I think if, if any of you are concerned about uh, understanding what, what a Labor government like, might be like, and it's worth looking up Penny's uh, uh, access point and, and, uh, and in the, all her speeches are listed there. And I'd, I'd recommend uh, uh, recent ones, but also ones in the past. One that uh, I thought was a very important foundation 
was when in, in uh, 2017, about six months after she'd been made shadow minister, she made a speech about what are Australia's national interests. And, and that's not a simple question, as I've already said, uh, but she explained it in, in, uh, in uh, very uh, logical and quite clear ways, I think, uh, uh, wanting peace and security, wanting uh, an international commitment to the rule of law, as Alison has been just saying is so important, to justice, to, and of course, also to dramatically reducing greenhouse gas emissions, which is a, a linked goal uh, if we're wanting to avoid this causing conflict. Uh, the, another very central point is that uh, Australia is uh, a relatively large economy and, and uh, uh, relatively influential given the smallness of our population. And uh, we can, can have a major impact if we choose to do so on the United Nations. And I think that needs to be um, taken far more seriously. In fact, I'd like to suggest to put on the agenda that there's a need, uh, if, if Labor is elected to government on the 21st of, of, of uh, May, that, uh, that they consider having a white, preparing a white paper on Australia's relations with the UN. The UN is a, a, a large, quite complex body. It, it's not nearly as large as people imagine, much smaller than many companies, but, but it is complex. And it's got about 40, 40 uh, um, sorry, I'll turn, turn off my, my, my uh, that's better my mobile, um, it, it's, it's, um, uh, oh yeah, I've lost a thread. Um, uh, what, what, what I wanted to move on to say about the UN is that at exactly this stage in the last six months, uh, there has been announced by, by Secretary General Guterres, a new, strategy for the multilateral system, which is entitled Our Common Agenda, Our Common Agenda. And I strongly suggest if anyone's uh, interested in this, that they Google that and they will find about an 80 page document, which goes through a whole series of the UN's responsibilities. It was prepared over a period of, of 12 months uh, the General Assembly requested the Secretary General to uh, prepare a new strategy to revitalize multilateralism was the, were the words that they used. And that was done by having a whole series of consultations with countries, but far more than countries, with organizations, with different people representing different age groups, younger people as well as older people, uh, different, different uh, uh, types of industries and so on and so on. It was a, an enormous consultation process. And then that was distilled into this 80 page document, which goes through a whole range of ways in which it's vital to reactivate, re-energize the multilateral system uh, one that I want to mention because it concerns me greatly and you greatly is that there's a section of it on a new, a new agenda for peace. And it's not a long section, it's just three or four pages, but there are a series of, of, of proposals in it about ways in which uh, countries could strengthen their work for peace. Uh, and, and, uh, a couple of them I want to mention. One that has to be taken very seriously by Australia is that exactly as Alison said, uh, our diplomatic service has been run down since 1995-6. Uh, 
At the time Alison left, uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade was receiving 0.38% of, of total Commonwealth agenda. 0.38% of common, total Commonwealth expenditure. 0.38, a tiny amount. In the last quarter since 95, 96, the proportion of Commonwealth expenditure being, being allocated for diplomacy has gone down to less than 0.2 of a, of a percent. So down from in 95, 96, 0.38, down to under now 0.2%. So it's been halved. The proportion of total Commonwealth expenditure on diplomacy has been halved. Now that is the height of irresponsibility. If any country wants to attempt to find peaceful ways of resolving disputes, it must have a generously funded, highly professional, skilled and empathetic diplomatic service. And the capacity of, of DFAT, our, our, our Department of Foreign Affairs, to do that has been deliberately undermined by governments. I say deliberately because they've cut, cut its funding. I don't think they've really thought about what they're doing uh, because it, it, and, and, and it's also true that at exactly the same time, funding for, for, for defense has been very substantially increased uh, in, in, uh, in, in real terms and as a share of national income. Uh, and, and at the same time, as you probably know as well as I do, aid has been cut. So while there are four wings of foreign policy, if you like, four, four aspects of foreign policy, one is diplomacy, one is defense, one is intelligence, uh, and, and one is aid. And, and the two constructive ones in that, in that uh, those four out of those four, diplomacy and aid have both had reduced shares of funding. So they're severely cut now. Now that, that suggests uh, no conscious thought to, to peace building at all. When, when, when an issue like co conflict comes to, to cabinet, uh, the automatic reaction of the Australian cabinet, like uh, the American administrations, is to think how to, uh, how to use military uh, defense to, to, to cope with that, with that conflict. They don't think as should be their automatic knee-jerk reaction about is there any possibility of, of having influence on that conflict through diplomacy. Uh, a, a major change that is needed in the way Australia uh, deals with foreign policy, which is to uh, have uh, DFAT renewed, better funded, and involved centrally in, in every kind of conflict situation, using the expertise that it should be gradually accumulating. I, it's not that, that some of DFAT's people wouldn't love to be doing that now, and probably many of them are, are trying to do it, but they're understaffed and, uh, and, and, and overworked and don't have the time to, to do all the work that they should. I, I was involved in doing a survey of, of DFAT a couple of years ago, and we interviewed about 120 uh, current and future diplomat, uh, former diplomats uh, about what they'd, how they'd handled um, uh, conflict. And, it, and we published uh, a, a report on that about a year ago. Uh, and I remember asking one of the people who'd been in charge of, of the peace building team that was sent in to deal with the Solomon Islands uh, 20 years ago when, that, when there, were, uh, there were fights going on there and Ramsey was set up partly with the help of New Zealand and Papua New Guinea and Fiji too. 
but uh, I and an Australian was was heading it up, and I asked him which books did he read in order to prepare himself for going to the Solomons, and he laughed and said, "I haven't got time to read books," and I, I, I shouldn't really have dobbed him in, but but. Um, I mean, I don't doubt that he was he was conscientious in trying to find out what he could, but but he was overworked, and they more time is needed. Uh, so uh, I've, I've sk skimmed through several of my my points. One was that peace is our goal. A second one was that the Australian governments have become preoccupied with militarized security and, and, and give far too little attention to independent focused work on, on, on uh, understanding conflict and addressing it. Uh, but so the third one is the erosion of diplomacy. A fourth one is that the, the situation uh, of Australia has been dramatically changed by the announcement six months ago that uh, by the US and, and Britain, that Australia was going to be allowed to purchase uh, eight or more nuclear powered submarines. Now that, 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 that is a, a huge shift in, in the way defense uh, or military activity is, is tackled by Australia. And that's called AUKUS, A-U-K-U-S, Australia, United Kingdom, United States. And if it happens, uh, it, it raises all kinds of, of problems, which you might like to talk about in the question time. I, I don't have time to go through them now, but I'd, I'd love to. I've got a long list of, of, of questions and, and, and expressions of unease and difficulty with it. My, my view is that the, the, the proposal ought to be seriously questioned and probably, and probably dropped. Anyway, we, we could talk about that later. And another thing that needs to change significantly about our foreign policy is the closeness of our of our tie with the United States. Uh, the, the, there may be some, there, there is certainly value in having alliances, but that doesn't mean that we should automatically do what the most powerful member of that alliance always wants. And, and the problem with the United States is that it's got an ideology of militarism uh, so that it approaches every problem as uh, international problem as if it was had a military dimension and and wants to draw other other associated countries into that to make it look 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 as though there's support for it. Their, their, their foreign policy is is erratic under Trump. Of course, it was it was extremely erratic and. Ser utterly misjudged in most ways. Uh, and another is that the America regards itself as exceptional. And, and because they see themselves as more powerful than anyone else, and because of their origins, they've had this, this view of themselves since the beginning of, of European settlement, that they were exceptional and that their intentions were always good. And therefore, they, they could both make the rules and disobey the rules themselves. And uh, it, it, our, our Australian interests and concerns and, and self-image is very different to that. And to let ourselves be too influenced by that, let alone dominated by it, is inept and irresponsible, really, because our interests are to have peaceful solutions whenever it's possible. And that's not the automatic goal of the United States. So 
I could develop that much further, but I've already gone over my time. Uh, so I'm arguing for uh, a renewal. Australia needs a renewal of its foreign policy, uh, uh, much more attention to diplomacy, much more uh, better funding for diplomacy, much better funding for aid so that we can make contributions to, to the development, to dealing with the problems that quite often cause conflict through the aid program, uh, that we should have behaved like a mature adult country, not like an adolescent who's got to rely on, on its parent in the United States uh, all the time. Uh, we, we need, we need uh, uh, to become considerably more thoughtful about our own goals and how those goals should be achieved. And I'd suggest that we're fortunate in having this common agenda under consideration in the UN at present. And that gives us a, a global opportunity for developing a more mature foreign policy ourselves. I, I can enlarge on lots of those things if you'd like later. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Joel. Um, can you uh, highlight uh, Ben uh, Allison as well? Ah, there Allison is, yeah. So Allison and Joel, you've uh, you've known each other for decades and often traveled in, in, on parallel paths. Uh, in what either both of you have said this afternoon, would you like to um, continue the conversation together? Uh, and John has outlined a number of uh, uh, issues, but you as well, Alison, um, would you like to comment? Thank you, Rhys. We noticed that um, in our chat column there, several people have raised some interesting issues of their own. And if John has a moment to run his eye down them, because he was working on his own paper just then, um, he might be interested in, in some of these questions. One of them says, do we need more people people-to-people -people diplomacy than government-to-government. -government. Diplomacy is government-to-government. -government. That's what it is. And every country does it. And it involves people-to-people -people because if you do it properly, you, whatever country you're in, your objective is to meet as, and get to know as many of the people as of that country as you possibly can. You do that by learning their languages, by reading their histories, John, and reading as much as you possibly can, as I've always done, and carted boxes and boxes of books all over the world and when we used to read in that manner. And, and the more of that you do, the more effective you are as a diplomat. Most Australians, because they hear very little about what our diplomats are up to, get the impression that it's nothing but a waste of wasted time at cocktail parties and so on. This is a rubbish view, um, to put it politely, that, that we need to get over and wake up to the fact that diplomacy, as John says, is a serious and important profession. And it's something, as I think I tried to point out, on which Australia has fallen backwards. Another of the interesting questions raised here, and it is, it goes to the practical application of diplomacy, is the case of Julian Assange. Mm -hmm. And um, consular work now takes up an enormous amount of that very small amount of money that is left to DFAT that John mentioned. And that is consular work. And in Julian Assange's case, we are not doing it. Can I give you an example? Uh, last year, I went to see my local member, Dave Sharma, who, um, and I raised with him the case of Julian, who at that stage had already been in Belmarsh High Security Prison, charged with nothing for more than two years. He's still there, still charged with nothing. And I said to him, 
when is the government going to do what Howard eventually himself did and go to talk to the Americans to get David Hicks out and get um, uh, Mamdou Habib out, which he did facing defeat in an election. Now, facing a similar situation, when will the prime minister do the same? I wanted to know. And Dave Sharma told me to get concerned with the case of Kylie Moore Gilbert and forget about Julian because that was British justice. And I despair. If that is the way our politicians who, who become our ministers and Dave Sharma would like and is qualified to become a, a future foreign minister, if that is the way our foreign service is guided by ministers, then I despair. And this is why, as John says, we have to rebuild our foreign service almost from the ground up. Can I uh, answer two of these questions? Um, I, I, the, the first one about uh, uh, is person to person contact important? Of course, it's, it's fundamentally and profoundly important and very valuable. Uh, I, I, was, uh, I was talking only about government diplomacy because you've got to limit your, your agenda to some extent, but, but I strongly agree. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the great things that, that had happened in the world before the virus came along and stopped travel was that Australians were, were, were traveling very widely and, and uh, relatively, relatively more than most citizens of most countries. And that is an opportunity to understand other countries better and also to help them understand us better. It, that it, so travel itself, tourism can, can be useful. It's not always, of course, but quite commonly, uh, somebody gets an interest in a particular area and then and sets up some particular direct relationship between Australia and, and that area. I, I, I remember uh, when my children were younger, uh, they had a teacher at school who was fascinated by Indonesia and had spent time there and, and, and taught them Indonesian and, and uh, built up contact between them and, and visiting Indonesians. And, and lots of people do that in lots of different ways. And uh, one, one of the great things about Australia is that we've got people from well over a hundred different countries who are now resident in Australia, and and the kind of conflict, the kind of contact between uh, longer term residents of Australia and and new new residents is a is another very important step in building up understanding. Uh, when I was a member of Parliament, uh, I the, I used to have to go to about forty national days of of people in Canberra, and and. Uh, each year, and that was a great way of learning, keeping up to some extent at least, with what was going on in in those countries. So, uh, if, if if people, we were, it was suggested that Alison and I make suggestions about things people would like to do. Well, I strongly support uh, contributing to that kind of specific link with some other country or some other some other situation overseas. There's, there's another question that's on, on the list here. Some, uh, uh, someone has asked, uh, said that it appears that intelligence and security apparatus now set the agenda for Australia's engagement with the world, not our diplomatic service. And uh, that's of course, that, that, is, that is true. Uh, I, I think they're, they're, uh, the diplomatic service tries to keep in touch, but it, it is true. For example, that a lot of the extreme judgments about China, which certain ministers are articulating, have been fed to them, it seems, by the intelligence agencies. And, and the intelligence agencies, 
do some of the work themselves, but they are also avenues for the American intelligence agencies to pass on views about what's happening. Now, I'm not saying, I, I don't want to say that that is always wrong or, or misjudged, but it clearly sometimes is. And a particularly well-publicized case which shows how, how, how much damage it can do was the acceptance by the Australian government that the justification for the American invasion of Iraq uh, was that Iraq was making nuclear weapons. Now, it, it later became absolutely clear that, that the Iraq had no capacity to make nuclear weapons because for the previous 10 years, there'd, there'd been sanctions that stopped the equipment and the kinds of materials that were required to make nuclear weapons from being purchased and brought into the country. And so it was a complete uh, uh, misjudgment. And, but that misjudgment was partly uh, built up by the very conservative Bush advisors on foreign policy, but it was also supported by the, by the intelligence agencies uh, and or, or by large parts of them, and that infected Australia as well. And so it wasn't questioned when, when uh, the prime, Australian Prime Minister, John Howard, decided with, that we should join with the, the US in invading absolutely illegally uh, Iraq, just as illegally as Russia is now invading Ukraine. Uh, and, and so we're being quite hypocritical in, 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 our, in our criticism of, of Russia. We are doing the right thing, uh, in my, of course, in, in, in being critical of Russia, but we should have linked that with saying, well, and we now know that we were wrong about invading Iraq. And there's not, been not a hint of that recognition of a mistake. There's a question in the chat about our understanding of the UN and its limitations because of this interest and even opposition from member states, which re uh, restricts its influence. A question by Doug Hewitt. And this kind of yeah, ambivalent relationship that we have, that Australia has with the UN. Um, how can we build that? Can we rebuild that? How do we turn this around? Well, the most important thing, I think, is, is by becoming as committed as we are required by the Charter to be in our engagement with, with the UN. Uh, quite our, our, our Australia's um, handling of, of its place in the UN is very uneven. Uh, there, there is there are some uh, times when when we are we are uh, quite actively supportive. For example, uh, in in trying to get gender equality in the handling of conflict through the um, peace building commission, and Australia. Uh, when it had a Labor government, was supporting very modestly the, the UN Peace Building Commission and was doing so in a way that strengthened the engagement of women. Uh, but in, in other ways, of course, we're, we're acting in co quite contrary to our commitments, uh, the way Australia has uh, brutally mishandled asylum seekers, uh, uh, it's been very uneven and discriminatory in our handling of refugees. Uh, has has been negligent in its neglect of uh, support for disarmament, uh, and not I'm not talking only about nuclear disarmament. Uh, Australia hasn't even signed the nuclear prohibition 
uh, treaty, let, let alone ratified it. Um, I could, we could go on and on. Uh, Australia has been very uneven in its handling of human rights. Uh, we're, 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 we're strongly uh, supportive of, of some human rights and neglectful of others. And, and that's a real embarrassment to us now. I'd like to, I'd like to strongly recommend to everyone who's watching today, uh, the, the new book by Gareth Evans, uh, which is it's a very small, short book. It's entitled Good International Citizenship, A Case for Decency. And in it, he uh, argues that it is both uh, proper idealism to, concern, to be concerned about human rights, to be generous with aid, to, to attempt non-violent non ways of resolving conflict, et cetera. But it's also strongly in the national interest to behave in, in those ways. And, and he goes through Australia's uh, performance in relation to, to issues like human rights and migration and, and conflict handling and so on, quite explicitly and accurately. I, I think it's a splendid book and, and uh, it's, it's, it's $20, but uh, I, I think it's, it's very well worthwhile for anyone who's interested in this area. And what that shows is that the person who, who asked this question uh, is, is uh, pretty well informed. Would you like to comment on this, uh, Alison, on what John has said? Yes, I will. Thank you, Vis, and, and thank you, John, for raising it, because that actually gives us a segue to another question from one of our um, audience, uh, or one of our participants here, asking, is there any prospect at all of a diplomatic outcome mm -hmm. with Russia? Now, we, we're going to have to get onto this sooner or later, so um, it would be disappointing our uh, participants if we didn't. The Ukraine situation gives us a, 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 an object lesson, gives Australia an object lesson in what we should be doing. As John says, we invaded Iraq. Russia invaded Ukraine. The two things are equal and opposite, and it is not for Australia to, to take the moral high ground here as if we've never done the same sort of thing ourselves. It is equally bad, whoever does it. Whoever invades a foreign country is guilty, potentially guilty of the international crime of aggression. That's right. It's a war crime. Unfortunately, the United States and, the, and Russia are not signatories to the International Criminal Court, which Australia is. And um, I can remember when that happened, John Howard didn't want to do it because he probably realized what he would expose Australia to. Australians can be charged with war crimes. And if we did that, we should be. Now, what prospect is there of a diplomatic outcome with Russia? Um, from Australia's point of view, the only way we could move towards such an outcome Come would be to do something similar to what the Indonesians are doing. The Indonesians have refused to um, uh, join the condemnation of Russia in the UN because they refuse interference in the internal affairs of other countries. Now, they are also not aligned. And that means that what they hope to do is to use their influence, particularly as a leading member of ASEAN, uh, of which, uh, to which um, the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, Russia is also a signatory, to try and bring diplomatic pressure to bear. And they will do that um, when they chair 
the uh, group of uh, 21 in Indonesia this year. It's a very important meeting for them to succeed. So they are holding back from condemning Russia. And they are saying, let us, let us keep the doors open for discussion because otherwise the world becomes even more polarized. Now, this is the kind of thing uh, which Australia should be supporting, in my view. What we're doing instead is backing up the United States side of what is in fact a tussle for global hegemony, which the United States refuses to share with a reorganized, re-empowered Russia or a peacefully risen and now very powerful China. And what we in Australia, as Australian, uh, Australians who hope for world peace and a middle power should be doing is saying, this is a very important moment in world affairs where the United States should be encouraged by its friends not to go on trying to be the one and only the greatest and using, as John says, military force to secure that, but rather we should be encouraging our friends in the United States to step away from military force, as indeed Biden has sort of done in Ukraine and say, let's stay out of wars. Wars are not the way to resolve problems. You have to call in the diplomats eventually anyway. So let's not have more wars. Let us encourage China particularly, which is holding back from military conflict over Ukraine, uh, encourage that kind of um, peace building approach, if you like, and take that side rather than banging the war drums, which is what our government has been doing for the last couple of years, as if we could win any kind of war against China, either supported by the United States or not. And Ukraine is just an object lesson for us in what could happen if we don't take the kind of path that I'm recommending. John, would you like to comment on the difficult situation with the invasion of, Iran, of Ukraine? Well, of course, I agree with what Alison said, uh, how to enlarge on that further. Um, it, it, is, it is a long way from us. It's not, it, we can't. We can't expect to be major players in it, but I think we could if we if we were serious uh, through our membership of the Uni United Nations, um, be encouraging uh, the debate there. Uh, there. There have been two sessions of the General Assembly. Uh, Australia has spoken there. I understand. There, there is one power that, that um, the Charter gives to the members of, of the UN, which as far as I know, has not yet been, been used. In, in, in the article, articles about the Security Council, uh, there's, uh, in Article 36, uh, the Charter says that uh, a, a country which is involved in a dispute should not be allowed to vote on that dispute in the Security Council. Now, clearly, uh, that would remove uh, the veto from Russia in debates about, about uh, Ukraine, if, if it was in force. But to my knowledge, it's not, not enforced by the membership. Australia could be urging members of the Security Council to try and, and, uh, and use it. There's, there are all kinds. One, one of the great 
strengths of the UN is that, that the headquarters are there. Every member country has a, has a, a mission there. Uh, any member with, who's, who's seriously engaged can be talking with other members about, about, about issues. And, and particularly when Australia was, a, was an elected member of the Security Council for two years, uh, uh, Australia was very active in that kind of uh, discussion, but, it, but you don't have to be a member of the Security Council to talk with members of the Security Council about what should be happening. There is no way of, of stopping the, uh, the invasion without political engagement, without diplomatic engagement. And of course, Putin is, is, appears to be unrelentingly determined to enlarge his empire. Is it, but nevertheless, Australia should be joining with those countries who are opposed to that absolutely improper, illegal, monstrous misuse of, 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 of military power to, to, uh, to uh, strengthen the, the opposition. The, the votes in the, in, the, in the General Assembly about the invasion were, I think, 141 uh, opposed, uh, five or something like that, supportive, and the rest abstaining. Well, there's a lot of work to be done with those, with those countries that are abstaining. Of course, one of them is China, and we've got very little leverage with, with China at present. But I mean, the thing about diplomacy is that, is that it has to be empathetic. It has to be sensitive and and sustained and and you, you can't just turn it on when when you want to achieve something you've got to be steadily building trusting relationships and 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 doing the things that make those trusting relationships credible and and really Australia's way back down the road uh, in, in not doing that uniformly I mean you, what, I used to look at Norway when 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 I was working there, and and Nor Norway uh, had had two white papers on their relationship with the UN. They they were active in in every conceivable way. And they're a country of about five million people, but we're twenty five million people. We could be active in in a host of different ways. Not that that would automatically or quickly lead to demonstrable change. But it would change the, the capacity for communication and, and trusting negotiation. And, and, and that's what we should be aiming to build. There's a question about uh, uh, the Russian ambassador here in Australia <coughs> and if he should be, uh, be expelled. What is your sense of that, Boudet? Can I comment on that? Yeah, yeah. Certainly not, yeah, absolutely yeah. not. The other <laughs> night we were going to um, a, 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 a Ramadan event at which the Muslim community was gathering and they wanted to know, should they invite the, they invite all the consuls general in Sydney, should they invite the Ukrainian consul general? And we said to them, they asked for our advice and we said, yes, of course, and invite the Russian too. The Russian consul general is a very personable young man, very energetic and very interested in what he's doing in, in Sydney. And have them both. Cutting off communication is not the way to go. And cutting, uh, refusing to talk to people is, is antithetical to what you eventually want, which is a, 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 pass, a pathway towards peace. You have to get them back sooner or later, so don't bother, is, is my suggestion. And, and if you want to make relations worse, you banish a, a country's diplomats. It's, it's just not necessary. It is not 
in response to any threat to Australia. And while we may have critical views about what Russia has done, that doesn't mean that we have to expel their diplomatic representatives. And I think the kinds of um, pile on that you see, um, for instance, unnecessary things like not having Russians play at Wimbledon, not having Russian composers perform at concerts in the United States, this sort of thing is really ridiculous. It, it, it is getting the thing out of proportion. You may not like what has happened in, in Ukraine, but the United States contributed to it, and so did the United Kingdom, a long way back when things could have been different in 2013, 14. A lot of things could have been done differently and were not. And so to suddenly turn on Russia now gives me the impression that that's what they wanted to do all along. That is not something that Australia has wanted to do and it's not necessary for us to do it now. Thank you. We're almost at the end of our allotted time. Um, John, would you like to comment on the expelling of the Russian ambassador? I agree entirely with what Alison said. Right. That we need to keep the relationship and yeah, we need I think, to keep I think talking. That's, that's one opportunity we have for, for attempting to have influence, but also uh, attempting to understand. Yeah. There are other questions in the chat as well, but I think we've come to the end of our session. And I would like to thank both of you for yeah, spending your uh, Anzac Day afternoon with us and being part of the preparations as well. Uh, the Racing Peace Network, we are meeting uh, during the week to see where we go from here. We were a rather impromptu network that has hung together. And I think again this afternoon with 70, now 72 people online, there is a big interest in, in these issues that we have uh, people from around Australia and also somebody from uh, uh, Genoveva, you're from, uh, in, from uh, Bulgaria, I think. We have some international visitors as well. So this is an issue that, that resonates. People want to know, want to hear alternative voices, and especially how do we get ourselves out of this mess? Because the trajectory we're on, uh, so focused on the fence, uh, might not give us the peace we all want. So thank you again very much for joining us. And uh, yeah, we'll, I'm sure we'll hear from each other again. And also in the media, uh, keep your eyes open for opinions by Alison and John, uh, because they are in the media, but you need to know the name and then you think. Uh, oh, in our first there session, they are we again. heard from John Langmore and So now and we'll Alison. have a break. Um, Alison Bernowski talking about the more global picture of Australia's role in peacemaking, Australia's role at the United Nations and Australia and where is Australia going with its diplomacy and they advocated for much stronger diplomacy and building positive relationships around the world, especially through the UN. Uh, now we come to our next session and I wonder, Leona, could you uh, uh, or can I ask Sandra Blamey to put her uh, mute button on uh, because we can hear you reading the newspaper there. Um, so we'll, uh, yeah, so now we come to the second half of this session and we've got two speakers. Uh, the first speaker is Margaret Hepworth. Margaret is a peace educator based in Melbourne. She was a high school teacher and vice principal for many years. Margaret founded the Gandhi Experiment and has written about this in the Gandhi Experiment book, teaching our teenagers how to become global citizens. And also in her book, Collaborative Debating, what I think is an interesting concept. Margaret is the president of Initiatives of Change Australia, Creators of Peace. Margaret keeps herself busy running various life developing programs in Australia and overseas. Margaret will speak for about a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes, and then Alicia Dundas will speak.
Alicia is a member of the Religious Society of Friends Quakers, and she will speak about conflict resolution processes from her experiences as a presenter of the Alternatives to Violence program, Friends Peace Teams, and her, and her knowledge of the work of the Quaker United Nations offices <coughs> in Geneva and New York. Uh, and the uh, focus of the Quaker United Nations offices is finding common ground through quiet diplomacy. In her day job, Alicia is a programs manager in humanitarian and international development, and she has worked for several NGOs. In the last years, her work has focused on several Pacific islands and Papua New Guinea. Alicia has a master's degree in peace and conflict studies at the University of Sydney. And the, this session will uh, have a similar format that first Margaret will speak, uh, then Alicia will speak, then we hope that Margaret and Alicia will uh, ask each other some questions and agree or disagree with what all have parallel views and then of course we uh, uh, we uh, encourage you to put questions in the chat so that we can uh, also towards the latter stage of this session include those questions uh, to uh, yeah to include that in the conversation and we'll see where the conversation goes so margaret would you like to start Mm. Thank you, Wes. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to begin by saying a warm Jekka, welcome. I uh, live and work on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, uh, but right now I am sitting on Gadigal country, um, so that's rather wonderful to be up here with many of you. Um, I do want to thank the Raising Peace uh, Festival for putting forward such um, such an interesting topic, this idea of peace and alternatives to war. Um, it was wonderful to hear from John and Alison. What, a, what an amazing beginning to this topic, a, a really deep exploration of, uh, you know, what our country could do if, as John said, we, we made peace our goal. Right? And we've really, really got our set to set our minds to this the idea that there are alternatives to war is absolutely true, but we don't often pause to really consider or put the time and energy or, shall I dare say, the funding, um, you know, behind what those alternatives are. So, you know, we, we, we've been talking politics. Um, I'm about to shift the conversation to education, because that's my background, 30 years in education. So I want to take you on a bit of a journey um, through what we can achieve when we attempt to teach non-violence in our schools. Um, I do want to begin with a quote from, um, from Martin Luther King, who of course is you know, so, so appropriate to this topic. Um, he said, those who love peace must learn to organize as effectively as those who love war. There's so much to unpack in that very simple statement. We could spend the next 20 minutes talking about just that alone. But this idea that we need to learn to organize, right? to really build um, our peace, uh, peacekeeping or peacemaking skills. And I will bring that into, you know, the education space. So, um, as I said, I have been teaching for about 30 years and it was about, it was about 10 years ago now that I began to ask myself some really, really serious questions about what we were teaching our kids um, you know, we teach them compassion, we teach them collaboration, we teach them to be kind. We have incredible anti-bullying uh, programs running across the Australian, Australian school curriculum and schools dedicate themselves to these things. Yet why was it then when we looked out in the big wide world, <laughs> there seems to be this, you know, this greed, this over competitiveness where was it coming from and how could we change the way we perhaps were educating, um, you know, educating our young people. 
So that was a journey uh, that began, yeah, about 10 years ago. At that time, I created my own education initiative called, and it became known as the Gandhi Experiment, teaching nonviolence as a conscious choice, not just to teenagers, but to teachers as well. And, and certainly in lots of adult contexts, I think it's very, very needed. Um, so I will, I'll just share with you this, a few, a few pictures. So we sort of get the idea because I'm, I'm going to shift the conversation from where it was at, but moving from politics to young people in education, I'm sure you can all see the connection, right? It is within a very short space of time that if you are teaching 16 year olds, within two years, they vote. Mind. So if you are working with the mindset, the attitudinal mindset of young people to allow them to make different choices, to allow them to or help them become critical thinkers, or even more creative in their approaches to solving real problems, then as they move into that voting space or into the workforce, as they become the CEOs and the managers, right? You are going to create a build a different society to what both Alison and John were describing for us as the current picture, all right? As I said, all of this work, we, um, I've, I've done many, many, many workshops with adults, so it's applicable there too. I worked, um, I've been running this for about, Oh, it's about nine or 10 years. And only recently last year, um, became the executive officer of a not-for-profit called uh, Initiatives of Change Australia. And I would suggest to everyone here, they are really worth looking up because we run life direction programs, uh, a beautiful program called Creators of Peace. Um, and Creators of Peace, uh, in a way, deconstructs peace it looks at all the different components um, that you would need to, to build peace and then brings them all together and challenges you to, well, what commitment are you going to make? Never mind your politicians. What commitment are you going to make to step out and become a courageous peace builder? I've just got to say there is nothing passive whatsoever about peace education. Um, one thing I did discover as, as I've traveled the world uh, running these workshops, you'll see here on this slide here, the, the phrase global citizenship. If I talk about being a peace educator in Australia, schools just sort of shake their head and they go, oh, we don't need peace education. I'm like, really, are you sure about that? Are you sure about thinking about ethical leadership, authentic, deeply honest, deeply courageous leadership? Are you sure about understanding that it's not just the leadership, you know, when, when we look at leaders of our country, but what Gandhi used to talk about with the inner Swaraj, the leadership from within, right? How do we bring that into, our, into ourselves? So, what would happen in Australia to get into the schools, I needed to use this phrase, global citizenship. And they were all absolutely, yes, yes, we need to learn about global humanity and global citizenship. Great, we're in. <laughs> As I traveled across India and Pakistan, um, China, if I talk about being, or perhaps not in China, but certainly in India and Pakistan, if I talk about being a peace educator, they're like, come on in come on in. And they, they say, we, we want kids to understand corruption. We want to, um, them to understand, you know, how they themselves need to stop being part of um, a corrupt system, right? Now, this is teachers inviting you into these conversations. In China, um, the conversation that the teachers were asking for more critical thinking, for a sense of global humanity? And what is a global citizenship? Can you share that with um, our children? 
Now that gets really interesting, doesn't it, when we start thinking about stereotypes of China, for example. And I think that's something that John and Alison were sort of very much um, alluding to. You know, why, why um, at the moment they, they entered that, courageously entered a discussion about the Russian war in Ukraine and courageously made comments about, you know, would you kick out the Russian ambassador? Would you keep the Russian ambassador here in the country to perhaps continue conversations, to perhaps hear another viewpoint? When you think about that, there is nothing different to that than looking at bullying in schools or sorting out very complex tense situations in a playground. Are you going to kick the bully out of the school? Are you going to attempt to find an alternative way? Now, most schools in Australia will attempt to find an alternative way. So it gets really, really interesting. Um, so I just showed you before, there was a picture of me um, at the Sabamati ashram in India. And uh, this is really where I'd already been asking myself these questions, deep questions. How do we unravel hate and fear in our society? What tools and methodologies could we bring into our schools to help us do this? And it was at that point that I began traveling uh, to India where interestingly, and the initiatives of change educators in India helped me travel across the country. And I went to the Sabamati ashram where you saw Gandhi sitting there, Gandhi's first ashram. And I sat in the very place that Gandhi um, prayed morning and night. And so many thoughts came, but one very, very clear thought was this. Too many people are experimenting with war and violence. We need more people experimenting with peace and nonviolence. And that was really the beginning, the impetus um, of this education initiative called the Gandhi Experiment. Believe me, there are lots and lots of other organizations bringing these kinds of things into schools, which is absolutely to be applauded. Um, at that point, a young Dutch couple wandered in and they looked around this ashram, reading all about Gandhi, and they said, this man was incredible. And then they said, but who was he? They'd never heard of Gandhi. So you can imagine me going, what? <laughs> I went home to Australia and began the Gandhi experiment. The first experiment, or the first question, asking uh, kids, teenagers in schools, have you ever heard of Gandhi? Now, I wonder if you could guess what percentage of children in classrooms now will put up their hand and say, yes, um, it's about a third. It's about a third. When I followed through with the question, how many of you know of Hitler? Guess how many kids put their hand up? Every single child in the room knows of Adolf Hitler. In fact, they can talk about Adolf Hitler, you know, at great length. So the question I would then ask them is why? Why is it? Why is it that we seem to know more about the bad stuff and not about the good stuff? Why aren't we actually learning the methodologies of, and I'm not talking about just Gandhi, but the people who put their lives, devoted their lives towards creating peace. Now, remember I said there's nothing about peace building that is passive, right? There are times when we stop and we meditate, that's, that's important. Um, in initiatives of change, one of their methodologies is quiet time and teaching everyone, adults and kids alike, to stop, to pause in your day, to have at least 10 minutes of quiet time for that inner voice to come in, right? For your inner consciousness to come in. If you're deeply spiritual, you may, you know, you may feel you are connecting with a higher power. If you're not religious in that sense, 
you will connect very deeply with yourself and you will connect with a sense of a global humanity. So that is not passive. That's just quietness. Now, what Gandhi would do is to always preach nonviolence. Right? That's the first, the first thing, nonviolence. You, whatever the situation is, right, you look for every single alternative that you can to nonviolence. So when we talk about violence with um, young people, we're asking, well, what are the forms of violence? So there's war, then, but there's also you know, physical, physical conflict. Yet there's also mental and emotional um, violence. There's also economic violence. So to keep people in this world in a state of poverty is a form of economic violence. Climate change is a violence to the planet. So we begin to move from the context of Gandhi, you know, in back in the mid 1900s, early 1900s, and into the context of today's world. This is really important. We're not learning about Gandhi per se, we're learning about methodology that helps us all understand how to build a more peaceful world, right? This idea of global humanity and how we relate to the planet is hugely important. Gandhi, as I said, I, I told you, I sat on the very place that he, uh, he prayed morning and night. He would then get up and take action. And this is hugely important. He'd listen to his soul force, his deeper innermost beliefs, and then take action on what came. And we all know that the action, again, I'm going to say it again, was it's not passive. It's, it's um, the word non-cooperation, right? Standing up, protesting. Right? The things, some of the things we're seeing now in nonviolent protests have come from that time. So then we all know that Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in this world. Now that's a statement of action. Be it, live it, do it now. Now, did he really say it? Apparently not. Apparently it was created from what he was saying and turned into a natty little phrase that we now all use, still a great phrase. What he did say, and I'll paraphrase it, is if you can change yourself within, the world around you will change. So this brings us, I think, um, to a series of methodologies that um, were created for the Gandhi experiment. And I know there, you know, similar things are used elsewhere. But one of them is to take young people out of themselves to the big global pictures, the big global issues. They love talking about this stuff and then bring it back closer to home, bring it back to your community, bring it into your school, the conflicts, the issues right in front of you, your family, and then right in here. And then you, once you can change yourself within, you bring that out again and you apply it to those issues that sit right in front of you, right? So there's this constant flow between inner transformation and global transformation. And IFC actually teaches this work to adults um, as well as young people. So we use lots of things, provocations, creativity, critical thinking, something called positive reality, which I'll share with you in a minute, the quiet time, the inner listening, story sharing. You know, imagine that Russian ambassador sitting with, you know, Ukrainians and sharing their stories. It's very, very powerful. I want to, because I know I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> In fact, my time is probably almost up. <laughs> I want to quickly take you into just a, two very quick things. Um, that we workshop with kids. So one is to ask them, what is the root cause of war? And they use a methodology, it's called Einstein's theory of why, why, why. And so you begin, oh, the root cause of war is religion. Well, why is that? Oh, this, 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 why is that? And why is that? 
And why is that? And I can tell you, I have been in workshops with Af Afghan refugee children alongside um, children from a school, the most expensive school in, in Victoria. And they're all in there together. And it was um, one of the children from the most expensive school who stood up to explain the depths, the depths of human ego and greed. And when he finished speaking, every child in that room broke into spontaneous applause. So the children who were, had been through these conflicts were hearing and understanding and they were all relating. And then they can take it to these next steps. How do we apply this to our lives? One very quick one is give me 10 ways to stop terrorism using nonviolence. And you give these young people time. They go into breakout rooms and they, they come back with the most extraordinary answers. Um, a 15 year old boy said to me, you ask your enemy, what is your truth? Deeply profound yeah. thought, right? They come up with all sorts of very practical things. And then you say to them, if you can do that, then what can you do to stop the bully in the playground using nonviolence? How can we stop domestic violence using nonviolence? And so the journey comes back in here. I will, I think I better stop, Wes, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, delicious. <laughs> very, and yes. there's more time. Thank you. Thank you Good. so much. Thank you very much, Margaret. And there's a question for you in the chat. Um, Chris would like to know the second half of your quote. If you change yourself within you, can you complete that quote? Oh, sure. The Gandhi Thanks. quote is, if you can change yourself within, the world around you will change. Thank you. Hmm. Well, now it's Alicia will speak about her journey in nonviolence and in, uh, yeah, and bringing that out into the wider world. Over to you, Alicia. Thanks, Wes. And lovely to hear what you had to say as well, Margaret. I, I'm also sitting on the lands of the Gadigal people today. So I want to acknowledge their elders, past and present and also recognise if there's any First Nations people here today to pay my respects to them. I'm going to share with you a little bit about my journey um, with peace. And I always take some time on Anzac Day to think about the costs of war and what it has meant for soldiers over the years that, you know, not just the loss of life, but the loss of um, a sense of the, the emotional cost, the loss of innocence, and um, yeah, the, the loss of hope in humanity that sometimes happens to people who've had to engage in military warfare. So I grew up as a Quaker, and many of you here I can see are Quakers. <laughs> so, but I'm just going to put a little bit of that into context. Um, the Quakers, the Quaker movement began in the 1600s and the idea was that um, each individual could have a direct relationship with the divine and they also felt in those early years that there was that of God in everyone and that's something that's continued and <clears throat> pardon me until today and if you think that there's something of God in everyone then you can't pick up arms and kill other humans. So that was when the peace testimony was formed. In 1660, Quakers wrote a declaration to King Charles II saying, we utterly deny all outward wars and strife and fightings with outward weapons for any end or under any pretense whatsoever. And this is our testimony to the whole world. And Quakers have continued along those lines ever since. So being conscientious objectors to military service, being imprisoned for their beliefs against war. Um, but for me, I think touching on some of what Margaret had said as well, this idea that it's not passive to be a pacifist. 
it's actually very active. And I think that's some criticism that we sometimes get as pacifists. Oh, you're just a coward or, you know, you're not doing anything. So throughout the last couple of decades, it's been an interest of mine to explore what it means to be active in um, creating positive peace and moving away from violence. And so in my early 20s, I got involved in the Alternatives to Violence project, which was actually started by Quakers um, through a request that they received from prisoners in a New York prison. And they wanted some tools to be able to respond to conflict in their lives nonviolently. And as the workshops developed and they, you know, um, prepared, uh, you know, the aspects of these workshops, I can see some similarities with the work um, that Margaret's doing in schools. And one thing that stood out to me was this idea that um, the balance, that you can have respect for yourself and care for others in a conflict situation. So it doesn't have to be either or, it doesn't have to be passive versus aggressive. It can be that middle way of flowing, of being assertive and things like that. And um, because AVP was quite successful in prisons, it then um, expanded out to be a community activity. And that was where I got involved. Um, it's also been run in schools and it's called the Help Increase the Peace Program, HIP, um, which some of you might have heard of. And then Friends Peace Teams have also um, adapted this model to be um, use of AVP type workshop tools for dealing with conflict, as well as some trauma healing processes. And that's been used for communities coming out of violent conflict. And particularly, I was able to visit um, people in Rwanda and meet others from nearby countries such as Burundi and hear about how their process of dealing with conflict and reintegrating returned um, uh, combatants into their community after they had committed atrocities was very powerful for people. Um, in my late 20s, I studied a master's in peace and conflict studies, as we said, and um, that was where I also came to love Gandhi <laughs> and was really interested in, in, again, the idea that he wasn't just passive in the face of colonialism. He wanted to explore active nonviolence. He wanted to explore how people could stand up against oppressors, but do it in a way that was consistent with beliefs. And I think it's also true for many Quakers and other proponents of nonviolence that there's this time of quiet and introspection and reflection, and then there's moving into action. And sometimes it just sort of flows from one to the other as people um, go along their nonviolence journey. And another um, person within that time was Johann Galtung, who talked about the idea of positive peace. So rather than negative peace, just simply being the absence of war, <clears throat> he was talking about positive peace. And that really resonated with a lot of the things that Quakers are involved with, you know, working to take away the occasion of war, which was um, something that George Fox had said earlier on. And so that meant humanitarian response in times of conflict. It meant working with people before and after conflict um, to do uh, conflict resolution and, and peace building work. And so um, that really resonated with me. Another thing that resonated with me when I was studying peace and conflict studies was this idea of um, protective accompaniment. So around the time um, that I had just returned from overseas and the invasion of Afghanistan was happening. And so I joined a peace group and became involved in activism there. And I became aware of people going over to Afghanistan and Iraq as human shields. 
And so that was another example of people putting their lives on the line, not being passive at all, but still being consistent with that non-violent approach. And um, I particularly was interested in the idea of protective presence, which is a little bit different to being a human shield. But this idea of, um, well, I think it was first Peace Brigades International who developed this idea. Um, <clears throat> the idea that the presence of international volunteers who are unarmed but protect civilians um, against their attackers provides a risk or it raises the stakes for the attacker or the coloniser or the occupier because they know that there's an international presence watching. It also provides moral support for those um, and international solidarity for those who are acting non-violently to oppose the occupation or whatever it is that's happening. And then thirdly, it gives people an eyewitness experience that they can then go home and share with others. And it's an advocacy for human rights and peace moving forward. And so I was able to spend some time in protective accompaniment um, with the World Council of Churches. There's a program called um, the Ecumenical Accompaniment Program in Palestine and Israel. And one of the things that really um, pleased me was seeing Palestinian activists and Israeli activists working together nonviolently to end the occupation and to stand up to brutality. So that was really important to me to see that happening and know that we were um, nonpartisan in that sense. Um, after I finished my master's, I, <clears throat> I worked at the Quaker United Nations office in Geneva as a program assistant. And the Quakers, um, after the Second World War, they were actually given the Nobel Peace Prize in 1947. And then the following year, the Quaker International Body, Friends World Committee for Consultation, was given accredited NGO status at the UN, and that allowed two Quaker offices to be formed um, at the UN. So that was in Geneva and New York. And so for 75 years, they've been sitting there and their, their purpose is to convene quiet diplomatic conversations and to promote the idea that countries should resolve disputes through dialogue. And I really liked this quote from Duncan Woods, who was um, a representative at the Quaker UN office in the 1990s, because um, you might have heard from the previous panellists, you know, about the challenges of international diplomacy. And he, Duncan Woods said, if we believe in the necessity of worldwide institutions to meet the needs of the whole human family, we have a duty to support and encourage those who work for them, whether as delegates or members of the Secretariat. We have to share with them the conviction that their work, though often dull, bureaucratic um, and unspectacular, is a worthwhile contribution to the achievement of human unity. Then he says, our task is essentially to demonstrate the spiritual dimension of international relations. So that's a nice segue from what you were hearing about before. Um, and so Quaker work at the United Nations has continued on with this theme of taking away the occasion of war and um, convening these quiet meetings, but which were actually quite amazing. So each Quaker house has a beautiful room where people are served lunches. And when I was there, because I was an assistant, my role was to prepare the quiche or whatever it was for the lunches. Um, and then diplomats would come and they knew that everything was off the record, that whatever they said in these meetings would not go back to their government or anyone else's government. And it really allowed people to build trust and to talk openly and comfortably about 
what a certain treaty might look like or what a declaration of human rights or you know, any of these um, matters that were being discussed, what nuclear disarmament might look like. And so many conversations were had in these Quaker houses that were then seen to really bring change um, at the UN level. And I think one of the cases that my boss at the time talked about was the mine ban treaty, because that was a lot of institutions um, and diplomats based in Geneva meeting at Quaker House. Also people who were personally affected by landmines, giving their experiences and talking about what it was like. And that eventually amongst many other contributions and advocacy and tireless work led to the 1997 um, treaty. Also the Quaker UN office has worked on other human rights issues as well as peace building so, and, and um, disarmament. So things like looking at the subject of women in prison and conducting research into the situation for children of imprisoned mothers and the human rights impact on children and leading to several recommendations um, for countries to pick up. They also worked on support for conscientious objectors over the years. And then more recently have been um, working on climate change, recognising that that's a major crisis and there's significant inequalities happening as crises are happening to do with climate change and that it's certain groups like Pacific Island nations who are most affected and so bringing their voices to the fore. Um, They've also done a lot of work on bringing civil society perspectives to the UN, particularly in the area of peace building. So bringing peace building actors, bringing people who've been affected by violent conflict in their country all to the table together with um, representatives of UN institutions and diplomats to give their perspective in the hope that um, whatever treaty or, or discussion is being made, that those perspectives are heard and integrated. Um, in recent months, um, I've heard from, I'm actually on the Quaker UN Office Committee for New York. And so I keep hearing what's going on at the moment. And recently, um, lots of Quakers were wondering, is the Quaker UN office going to respond in some way to what's happening in Ukraine? And um, again, like we were talking about, you know, there was a, a time of discernment and then the Quakers working at the UN office came to the realisation that their strengths and their where their efforts can have the most value is in things like humanitarian assistance and sowing the seeds of reconciliation and leaving those bigger negotiations to other actors who are better placed to do that. Um, so that was an interesting process, again, of, you know, talking through and, and going into quiet. Um, and so I think what I just want to end my thoughts on <laughs> is a more hopeful moment. So we're coming up to the 75 year anniversary of the Quakers being involved at the UN. And I think there are um, places where, while it might seem hopeless and, and we've been through COVID, we've been through several crises, but the fact that these institutions exist, that the UN exists, that um, that there are people who care and continue working very hard to bring about a just peace and a positive peace gives me hope for the next 75 years. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Well, we've heard a lot from Margaret and Alicia. Uh, Margaret, you didn't talk in your um, presentation about your collaborative debating strategy. And I wonder if you can just 
uh, talk about that and then uh, then see how that fits in with some of the work that Alicia has done with the Alternatives to Violence uh, oh, project. Thank you. Thank Alicia, that's mighty impressive um, <laughs> what we're hearing and I, I, I will be in touch with you for mm -hmm. sure um, and looking at the work you know initiatives of change could perhaps tie in with you. Um, thanks, Wes. Look, it was when I was asking myself those deep questions, what are the structures in schools where we say we're not competitive, but in fact we are? And um, look, there's quite a few ranking children, you know, grading children, um, but one of them is adversarial debating. Our traditional form of debating is to set up two oppositional teams. Um, if you become very good at debating, you are actually taught how to rip the other team to shreds to win an argument. Now, you might do this through, you know, intellect. You might do it um, through ridicule. I created, I've got the book here. I created um, a manual. It's called Collaborative Debating. Um, and I've taken it into many schools across Melbourne. Um, in that workshop, we talk about why would we change the framework of debating? And I show them a very small film clip of, of three and four year olds arguing and unable to use their language to sort out an argument and it results in violence. When I ask these teenagers, where do you see adults arguing like this? I've never been in a school that does not say our politicians argue like this. And I don't put that in those words in their mouths. So collaborative debating reframes uh, debating. You have an affirmative team and a cooperative team. The win is to solve the problem. Right? It's not to win against each other. Um, there is a mentor who gives guidances throughout the debate. Um, there are leading questions that the mentor asks and the audience is fully participat participative in the debate. There are quiet times when I've seen 14 and 15 year olds go into quiet time looking for new inspiration and wisdoms. And when they come out of quiet time, they, they go, oh, we haven't talked about this. Mm -hmm. They're open to saying, I've changed my opinion halfway through the debate. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody over there has convinced me of something. I've learned something. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the number one topic that we've taken across Melbourne schools is really, really interesting. And Alicia, you know, thanks for beginning with your acknowledgement um, to the First Peoples. And the number one topic is, should we change the date of Australia Day? And it is extraordinary what young people are bringing to that question alone and what they are bringing to elevate, you know, respect and acknowledgement of the history of our country. And so I'll just quickly wrap up by saying um, Initiatives of Change is now working um, with First Nations elders um, we're running a program called Turek very soon, um, which uh, allows First Nations voice to be heard. We look at truth telling and truth hearing and work very particularly with Uncle Shane Charles, who is a, a Yorta Yorta man, for cultural intelligence solutions. There are solutions that our First Nations peoples can bring that we haven't even begun to unpack. So we need to be listening. Thanks, Wes. Yeah, so Alicia, this collaborative debating, uh, is that something that you've come across in, in your journey with alternatives to violence and at the UN? Is that a concept? Not specifically, um, but I was just thinking when you were talking about that, Margaret, about cooperative games. Because you know how there's so many great competitive board games, but there's quite only a few <laughs> cooperative board games. And I recently bought one of those cooperative ones for my nephew, and I was pleased that he did actually enjoy playing it. Because I think it's like you say, it's something that we need to be fostering at all stages with young people. Um, 
and I had a question for you. If is that all right, yeah. Lisa? If I can, <laughs> I I also studied peace journalism when I did my peace and conflict studies, mm. and I I was touched by what you said, Margaret, about you know a third of people know of Gandhi, whereas everybody knew of Hitler. And when we studied peace and conf uh, peace journalism, it was all about, you know, the way that the media frames these things and the way that we're socialised to believe. So is there anything more you think the media could do or other <laughs> actors could do to shift those, um, the mindsets of young people who haven't heard of Gandhi? Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you. That is such a good question. When I asked that question, you know, who's heard of Gandhi, who's heard of Hitler, why do we know more about this and not enough about this? Um, everywhere I've travelled, so this is across Australia, India, Pakistan, into China, um, young people will answer it. They'll give me two answers. One is our global leaders. Mm -hmm. they, they can't find inspiration and, and, you know, from most global leaders. They'll come up with one or two there's one in particular not so far from us that they they name um but the second one is the media mm -hmm. and, and all these young people across the globe are actually naming the media as as one of the most powerful forces of bringing negativity down upon them mm -hmm. Um, and so we explore, well, how can we change that? We've got social media. How are you going to, you know, help social media become more positive? Um, but absolutely the media needs to look at um, themselves. They need to examine themselves. I would love them to come into some of our <laughs> courses, young journalists. So um, I teach a methodology called positive reality. Now, when young people are feeling completely overwhelmed, right? They go into either a state of apathy. Now, they think about this. They've had climate change railing down on them. They've had COVID, a few years of COVID. Now this, this war, and it's heavy, mm -hmm. right? When this happens, they'll go into either a state of apathy or taking action, but they often arc up. You know, this is alcohol, this is drugs, this is a way of escaping this stuff. So what we've discovered, and I've seen this done within two-hour workshops, is to change, it's called an attitudinal shift, positive reality. We're facing the reality. Climate change is a reality. We need to know it, understand it. But guess what? There are so many people with so many solutions working across the world, and I show them these to them and they're like we've never seen this why isn't our mainstream media showing us you know people like boy and slack cleaning up the pacific ocean they've never heard of him so what we need to do we flood our children's minds with hope you mentioned hope before alicia flood them with hope and they shift to a place of positive action you mean i can get involved in actually making significant change yes you can and then away they go. It's it's real, but the media needs to take on a sense of positive reality. Yes, there's a problem. You know what is happening in the world that are actually actually the solutions. Why isn't the media highlighting people like you, Alicia, <laughs> or Alison? Why, why isn't Alison our prime minister? Sorry, just had to say that out loud. Um, <laughs> back to you. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question in the chat um, from Joyce from uh, Creators of Peace. Um, is there a personal experience you have had which has helped your work? Is there have the because life is not all you know things don't always go according to plan and there are obstacles. But are there times that you thought now I'm getting it and this is what I can draw on? Alicia, would you would you have an experience yeah. like that that you think now 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 I'm getting it? Well, um, several experiences, yeah. you know. As I guess, especially when I was a young person and I was moving into this area of 
of work and study and, you know, engaged in my own conflicts interpersonally and, you know, wondering why aren't I getting along with people or, you know, what's the way forward? So I think that was what kind of drew me into AVP and I think it's a really key aspect you know, it's very easy to say, oh, you know, we're going to come in and we're going to teach people how to be peaceful. But, you know, it has to come from me first. I have to um, learn to deal with the conflicts in my life in a more constructive way. Um, but there was a situation um, recently in my work where um, I found that somebody was uh, I guess, behaving in a way that made me feel uncomfortable. And I thought about how could I respond to this? And I decided to approach the person and talk about it, but not to do it in a confronting way where they were shamed in front of others or anything. So I just shared my experience of what it was like hearing those comments. And then um, you know, and what I would like in the future from this person. And I got a lovely reply back and we've become really good colleagues ever since. So uh, that's kind of drawing on some of my experiences with peace and conflict and putting it into practice in my own life. Mm. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Margaret? Yeah, it, it's a really, really good instance. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, to talk about something deeply personal and quite happy to share something. Um, so for me, um, I, look, I agree with uh, Alicia. We, we might call ourselves peace educators and we might work in, you know, particularly looking at conflict resolution. We teach this to kids, conflict negotiation, um, strategies for, you know, remaining calm in stressful situations. It doesn't mean we still don't get angry or hurt or we don't we don't get it wrong. We don't, you know, suddenly blast at somebody. That and every time that happens, I actually think, oh no, it just it's proving to you that this stuff is difficult. This is all about human emotion. It's difficult. It's not easy. Um, but one quick example was at an initiatives of change. It was at a creators of peace. Um, gathering in Sydney in a in a uh, Russian temple and um and I was struggling at the time in um the relationship that I was in and we went into a quiet time I was leading this small group right small groups all over the about, about a, over 100 women there and I was leading this small group and the question was what are your courageous next steps towards peace and this is the beauty, I went into the quiet time state. Consciously, I knew the answer. I was going to India to work with peace educators in India. I knew the answer. So when I shut my eyes and went into this deep state, I went straight to India. And then something within me drew me back. Literally, I could see a line being drawn to the present relationship I was in, the struggles I was having. It took me all the way back to my ex-husband mm. and and it was all about asking forgiveness from him and I remember consciously going what are you talking about that's ridiculous two weeks later I found myself in a cafe with my ex-husband talking about everything that happened and literally asking for forgiveness and it was a difficult conversation but we moved through it and that was that was a long time ago now and today we share the parenting of our children really, really well. And without that initial conversation, I don't think we'd be where we are today. So that whole idea of this, it begins with you, is absolutely true. Did I go to India? Yes, I did. Did that journey take place? Yes, it did. But I had to do something within myself as well. Yeah. Mm. Oh, thank you for sharing that. It's yeah, that we don't, we've learned not to put ourselves on a pedestal, <laughs> say that because we, you know, this is 
who we are, this is the work we do. Therefore, our own lives are smooth and we have a quick answer and we settle everything that we just live lives like everybody else. Yes. Uh, with ups and downs and, and difficult issues to solve. Definitely. Mm. Yeah. 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 There are, have been a lot of questions in the chat. So please, uh, 66 people online, if you've got questions, uh, put them in the uh, chat. And there was a question for you, Margaret, uh, in your work at high schools, at schools, and also, I suppose, with adults as well, difference between girls and boys or uh, women and men. When mm -hmm. you talk about ideas in peace, do you pick up a difference in responses in ways of dealing with issues of peace or yeah. what that's, is your sense? That's a, really, that's a really, really good question. Um, nothing incredibly obvious. Um, girls do, you know, we all know they talk more. <laughs> girls talk more. However, uh, and, and they get very, they come up with these highly creative ideas. Um, some of the things about Islamophobia um, where they decided to put out really positive pictures of Muslims through social media, right? So, you know, the, the girls love to talk. The boys definitely, we run a session called Almost Impossible Thoughts, and this is your chance to share what your biggest, you know, almost impossible thought is, because Gandhi had them and Mandela had them and Mon Mother Teresa had them. The boys will definitely come up the front and they will, you know, they'll talk in that more um, authoritative way. But I've had extraordinary uh, things. When we dive deep, the boys do open up and they come up, you know, again with just the most interesting ways of solving problems. Um, it, you know, look, for older men, I will just say, I think the younger generations are being raised differently. And I can see a difference in younger Australian men um, being more prepared to say to their mates, I love you, um, and share their problems. Um, and I think older Australian men, perhaps, not all, nobody on this call, um, still suffer from being raised to push their emotions down. Yeah. So you'll find the differences there. Mm. Mm. In your work, Alicia, have you found a difference? Uh, and perhaps even in your accompanying work in Palestine, how the way men and Palestinian men and women reacted to you, or at least Israeli men and women reacted to you? Um, well, there were actually gender sort of dynamics, even within the team of international um accompaniers so I was in a team of four and we had certain dynamics that had to be worked through due to yeah I guess men historically having different ways of um approaching tasks and situations um and yes there were gender differences within the communities we were working with um, but no more so than, you know, the, our team and the struggles we had and how we dealt with inappropriate behaviour when it happened within our team and how we got through our own interpersonal conflicts. So, mm. yeah, that was, that was interesting. Mm. <laughs> um, I also just noticed in the chat somebody mentioned the game Monopoly Mm. And I believe it was actually developed by a Quaker or a, a previous version in order to teach people about the perils of capitalism. Oh. And it had the opposite effect in the end. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just a little snippet. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, there's a question in the chat about uh, uh, the role of Australia and the UN. Um, in which way we could change the dialogue in Australia regarding the UN and other international bodies. I mean, it's a big question, mm -hmm. uh, but our previous speakers, John and Alison, uh, spoke strongly about our declining role for many years. Have you got any reflections on that? Perhaps Alicia, from your work uh, 
yeah. in, in New York and, and also your contact with Geneva? Well, I was also thinking um, in a past role, I was involved with developing an election resource, which was basically um, materials around some of the key social justice issues that might arise in an Australian election and what to ask your local member or your aspiring prime minister. And so I, I still think that that's a really key way um, to make a difference in this election time, you know, to ask people really careful questions about will they fund the UN to the extent that we need to, you know, how much will they prioritise um, overseas aid, which, you know, other OECD countries have committed to 0.05% of um, the budget and Australia is way below that every single time. So, you know, how can we continue to be a voice holding our politicians to account, particularly at this time when they're seeking to win an election? Mm -hmm. yeah. An interesting question for you, Margaret. Do you have an insight about civil society's role moving members of parliament to collaborative politicking? Or politics? <laughs> yeah, because I think it is kind of such an in your face example when they're all yelling and hurling yeah. abuse at each other. Yeah. Um, there are there, there is a movement. Um, I, I can tell you when I run collaborative debates in schools, they all say to me, are you taking this into parliament? Um, I have actually thought about bringing it first into local councils, moving to state parliament, you know, and, and, and up, up to the big, <laughs> the big guns up the top. Uh, big guns, that's a terrible phrase. Um, so there are other groups. There's, um, there's many, many groups looking at different forms of democracy, different ways of, you know, of speaking with each other and bringing these into politics. Um, yeah, absolutely. C can I just come back to that UN yeah. question just very yeah, briefly? Yeah, yeah. Um, we are, uh, so IFC is now talking about working with the Institute for Economics and Peace. Mm. And they're, you know, they're a global organization and, um, but they also talk like Alicia did about positive peace and negative peace. And they have the, their eight pillars um, of positive peace. And they have a way of uh, uh, gathering, you know, the metrics around measuring peace, which is something we never thought was possible. And they've created a global peace index. Now they actually do work. The UN is looking to them now. They've been doing this for 15 years and the UN is looking to them for how we can measure peace. And, you know, and what are these eight pillars? What are these things that countries need to have to be working on to, to really um, to build peace in their countries. Just really quickly, does anyone know where Australia stands on the positive, uh, in the global peace index? Hmm, it's fascinating. We are number 13. And um, if you'd listen to John speaking earlier, um, I wonder where the US is. They are way down in the hundreds and hundred and something. Mm. Right? Iceland is up the top. <laughs> Yeah. So it's lots of interesting ways we all need to look at engaging with the UN, I think, and bringing these in. Mm. Doug Hewitt in the chat is uh, drawing attention to election resources uh, by several churches. I also know the Australian religious response to climate change has mm. also a very good uh, election, election mm. uh, guide. Uh, very, uh, yeah, very deeply considered in uh, in different ways. Mm. Yeah. What question do you have? Can, can I add one thing, Wes? Yeah. I find this really, really interesting. This is coming back to the first peoples of this country. Yeah. Um. So you know, we're we're putting a figure of eighty thousand years that you know they have been living in Australia. Um, they will say, well, you know, we never migrated here. We were always here. But for 80,000 years, or well, certainly in, you know, more, yeah, there were never 
There was never a major war in this country. We are one of very few countries in the world where the people of the country created a system that stopped, it didn't stop conflict or minor conflict or problems, issues, tensions, but there was not a major war. Mm. And again, why aren't we studying that? Mm. <laughs> and respecting each other's land, each other's attachment to their land, mm. their right to be where they are. Yeah. yeah. We have a lot to learn, a lot to learn. Yeah. Any final comments from Alicia or Margaret on what you've heard and what's been in the in the chat? Alicia, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just reflecting on a few of the comments and sort of looking at them as we were talking. Um, it's really great that so many people showed up today and so many people who already have, you know, huge experience in the field of peace. So I feel quite humbled to be part of this discussion, but I really hope that we can continue on talking about how we can do more to create um, a positive peace and how we can set our minds to peace, you know, rather than all the emphasis on setting our minds to war. Yeah. 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 Any yeah. final comments, Margaret? Yeah. Um, I, look, this has been wonderful. I really, really loved listening, you know, earlier on to John and Alison and Alicia, you know, again, it's fantastic. And I think it's we become very powerful when we collaborate with each other. When these organisations come together as, as literally is happening right now, we become more powerful and the message carries further, right? And so I would really encourage anyone on the call today, you know, to be looking up some of these websites and thinking how, how can I engage, reaching out, reaching out to each other. I've got a Message from Marty. The answer is yes, Marty. <laughs> Sorry, it's about. <laughs> I just had to say that I have no time to write back to you. Um, it's about writing a paper. So I think I'm, I'm just going to come right back to the very beginning to say there are alternatives to war. There are alternatives to war. We need to believe that. We need to do the right thing by our children and allow them to see that, help them to see that. And peace is teachable I'll leave it well thank you all very much for coming i know margaret needs to rush off to get back to melbourne uh, and uh, yeah so thank you all for coming and uh, participating in the raising peace event over this long weekend